Monaco. So, hi again, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, and just a fantastic delight to have Michael Lelowitz with us for this series and for this talk on this date. Please tell us how you have been and are and are going to continue living history. Okay, um, thanks very much for the invitation. I've really been enjoying uh, watching some of the previous talks and Rice's talk just now, which I really resonated with a lot. Um, you know, I have to be honest, I was sort of struggling with what to talk about because I, I feel like when you start thinking about these questions of trajectory over time scales of years or decades, you get into all of these deep eternal questions about life. You know, how much is chance? How much is choice? How much is the environment? And how much is your own internal character, whatever that is. And uh, I think that's especially true with just this question of scientific trajectory and it's even more true with biology because, you know, I, I think right now in science, there's such a huge array of questions and problems and systems and they're all really fascinating. And there isn't really something where I think any of us could say we could only do this and we couldn't do something else. So it's a kind of paradox of choice and it's always a struggle. I think to figure out why you why you're going what you're going to do next and why you did what you did even in in retrospect. So I was thinking a lot about that. So let me let me I'll try to hopefully address that a little bit. So let me start with the family background since that's uh, always critical for everyone. This is my mom. She was a um, uh, kind of an artistic person, very um, spontaneous and almost impulsive, um, and self-taught and just with broad and and enormous interest in virtually everything. And this is my dad, um, who was an aerospace engineer and much kind of steadier presence and very warm and supportive person. And here we are uh, early on. This is, <laughs> this is my family and this is me here in the bottom right corner with that strange expression. So one thing my dad did was he bought an IBM PC in 1982. So this is basically a picture of me and my uh, first love, I guess, uh, early in life. And I grew up in LA in Beverly Wood. So I think not Beverly, which we just heard about, but uh, Beverly Wood neighborhood in LA. I think of LA as a very strange, free, weird and creative place uh, then and now. And I went to a, a public school, a human, humanities magnet actually. And so uh, during high school in particular, I really began to think of myself really mostly as a writer and that that was what I wanted to do in life. Um, here's a picture of my class. This is like a ridiculous suit that my mom uh, bought for me for that picture. Um, but even though I was really focused on writing humanities and all of that sort of thing, um, you know, I did get up at 7 a.m. for a, an optional physics class that was run by Mr. Bunning, who's shown here. And I think so there was always a kernel of interest in physics somehow, uh, despite that. But when I went to college at Berkeley, I was really, you know, I really thought that I would do something like writing. Um, but, you know, in my sophomore year, I just got really excited about physics. I started taking the, you know, the real hardcore intro physics class. And I just loved the whole thing, the, the whole culture of it, the back of the envelope calculations, the derivations, all the stuff that I think everyone on this call uh, probably got into as well. And so it was natural for me to go to Princeton or really just to go to grad school in physics. I mean, not necessarily Princeton, but I ended up at Princeton in physics. And, um, you know, when I was there, I, I really didn't know, again, what I wanted to do, particularly a lot of things seemed cool, cosmology, biophysics, you know, lots of things. I was still kind of rudderless and adrift, I guess. Um, but uh, one day uh, during, I was taking a stat med class there and, and Stanislas Leibler was teaching it. And here he is. And, um, you know, I was, I was talking to him, he took me across the street. He had just set up this uh, lab in the biology building across from Jadwin Hall. Um, and he was studying cytoskeletal dynamics. And the amazing thing that really blew my mind was he had like a, a microscope with a video camera and you could just like watch the dynamics in this case of microtubules. And it was so simple, so easy, so low tech really. And you could just really be at the edge of making new discoveries with almost no overhead. It just seemed like so incredible. And the other thing that was amazing, I think, uh, with Stan was, you know, he really just conveyed this amazing sense of the opportunity that was out there in biology, all of the questions that were unanswered, and the sense that all of us could really make profound transformative discoveries. He seemed to have that confidence um, in himself and in us, us, and it was really amazingly enabling, I think, and it really had a, a profound uh, effect on me. 
Um, the other thing Stan did is he gathered together this incredible group of people. Um, I'm sure many of these people look familiar to you, Uri Alan, Natalie Balaban, Nama Barkai, Rui Kishoni, many, many amazing people. And they were all physicists who really wanted to get in, into biology. And this was kind of the place to do it. So we had this incredible environment. Now, the other thing, the thing though, that was that for most of us, uh, even though we thought biology was pretty cool, none of us really knew how to do any kind of actual biology experiment. So there was sort of a lack of training but that's where some kind of serendipity came in because we were down the hall from someone named Mike Surrett and, and several other amazing postdocs. And Mike was a postdoc studying chemotaxis. And he um, really generously just taught us all how to do uh, experiments. Uh, I, I think of Mike as a kind of like Yoda, except younger and Canadian, if, if you can imagine that. Okay. And then after a year or two, Bonnie Bassler came and she brought quorum sensing circuits. And so we had this hallway that I think was really kind of crackling with uh, excitement, actually. Now, while I say that, I know that people often talk about like amazing moments and <laughs> this was an amazing moment, but I just wanted to say that even in the midst of this amazing moment, if I think about it honestly, all of us were doing a lot of complaining a lot of the time, you know, Princeton was not New York and America was not France for some people and biology was not physics. And uh, science now is not like how it used to be in the past and was better. And so I just wanted to mention that because I think like even when you have the good fortune to be in an amazing environment, it doesn't mean that everybody is sitting there uh, celebrating every moment of the day. Um, so I think about that, especially when I look at Twitter sometimes, you know, all the complaining you see there. Okay, so what was I doing? So I was working on microtubules, green fluorescent protein, um, the diffusion of bacteria, a whole lot of interesting things. But I still felt like I don't think I had really found like my own uh, identity in any kind of clear way. Um, but what was going on at the time was a lot of interest in molecular circuits. This idea that now I think of as kind of the foundation of systems biology, that biological prop, you know, uh, functions and phenomena are really controlled by circuits of interacting proteins or interacting cells. And so, you know, it's not that that was totally new. You can see it in Jacob and Minot, you know, but it's just that there's a space of circuit design that's vast and it's still kind of really barely explored. And there was like little bits of theoretical work here and there, like this book that I loved when I was in grad school about kind of the properties of biological circuits. Um, and so actually I feel like everything I've done, since, you know, my whole career really stems from this question of circuits that was really brought to, that really kind of articulated for me by, by Stan and by the other people in the lab. Okay, so I was thinking about these circuits. I mean, th these were in the air, but uh, I always found when I read a bio biology paper and there was a bunch of a circuit diagram at the end, I always felt suspicious. That was my main feeling. I was suspicious. How do you know that those arrows are sufficient to give you that behavior? It seemed like, you know, again, thinking about the pro programming that I used to do as a kid, it just seemed like the only way to really know would be to control the interactions, do it yourself, and then see if you could do that, whether it did what you expected. And so that was this idea of trying to build a circuit in order to understand it. And so I got this idea that I was gonna build an oscillator because physics, oscillators are everywhere at the core of physics, right? And um, I started thinking about that. I was telling everybody that I was gonna do that. And I got a lot of mixed feedback on that. Somebody told me it's kind of pinheaded. Another very famous person said, it's just not gonna work because biology doesn't work that way. Uh, but there was also like positive feedback too, you know, and I think what I got from that was just this idea that you, know, you really have to listen to what people say both, you know, you know, it, it's, it's not determinative, not everybody knows, what, nobody knows really what's going to be useful or not useful. Um, but I think the, the main thing I wanted to say is I think this experiment, which ultimately generated these kind of oscillating E. coli was really generated by doubt, this nagging persistent doubt about the, the, what, was, what you could say from these circuit diagrams. And that was sort of with me. I went to a postdoc. My, my main motivation for training the postdoc, I think, was I wanted to move to New York City. <laughs> I'd been out of New York. I wanted to be in New York. But I also was able to go to an amazing lab, Arnie Levine, who's just a phenomenal person. And um, I started a collaboration with Peter Swain, who was working together with uh, Eric Sidia. So I kind of was able to work with amazing people there. But again, what was, what was I going to do? And I think it was, again, this nagging doubt. I was giving talks about the repressilator, but I was telling people there's variability, but maybe it's due to noise, stochasticity. But how do I know how much noise there is? How do you even know if the noise is sufficient to control the oscillator? You know, like how I felt I didn't believe myself in short. Um, and so I one night actually while visiting Mike's Red, I, I thought of this little experiment with two colors of fluorescent proteins that you could use to kind of visualize and quantify 
noise and gene expression. And again, it was sort of just driven by this doubt, but also by this image that it would be great if you could really see noise in some way. Okay, so then I came to Caltech, um, which is where I started my faculty job and I'm still here. And um, once again, I would say it was kind of the same theme. I was giving talks about noise now, and I was telling people noise could be a feature, not just a bug. It could be useful. It could allow cells to kind of flip a coin and probabilistically differentiate. But how do I really know that? And so it was that question that really, it was, it was driving me crazy that I didn't, I, I didn't believe myself. So <laughs> that, was, that led to this project with my first postdoc, the amazing girl, Suelle, and my longtime uh, collaborator, Jordi Garcia-Lajalvo, two amazing people. And we started using Bacillus subtilis as a model system to look at probabilistic differentiation, a phenomenon where cells seem to really flip a coin to kind of make decisions, to really use noise to do something. And then, you know, in the years since, I feel like this principle of just kind of following the doubt, it really helps me a lot figure out what to do because I, I have kind of a doubt detector circuit now in my brain and I look for those things that are really bugging me. So when I say to people that we can build to understand in mammalian cells and learn about properties of mammalian circuits like maybe chromatin regulators, you know, I, I find myself doubting that and I, I want to see if it's really true. And so, um, you know, that together with, of course, the interests and the identities of the people that I work with, like in this case, work uh, lack of into who's now has her own lab at Stanford and John Young, who's a, was an amazing grad student. I think that really helps to drive uh, this otherwise impossible decision of what in the world to do. Okay, the other thing I should say, I think everybody who's run a lab knows the importance of like uh, mentoring or tour mentoring in this case. Um, so <laughs> I think um, we've had like, um, I think part of it is gathering the group that you want to have around you. And that's the beautiful privilege of being a professor is that you get to choose amazing people that you just enjoy working with. And I've really been fortunate to have so many incredible people, Long Kai, Taraj Dalal, I'm leaving out, you know, tons. Um, and uh, we've been able to create some t-shirts of our projects along the way. <laughs> so that's actually been more satisfying to me. So I clothe, I try to, I try to dress my, my people in that way as well. Um, Anyway, so just to conclude, I would just say, I just wanted to stress that theme to me. There's some, something inside of you that will tell you what you don't, when you don't believe yourself. And I think that's a good guide. Um, the community is essential as, as uh, Rice has said, and, and so many other speakers in the series have said. And I think the last thing is like, I think this principle is transferable. So, you know, what you do for yourself in the early years, thinking about your own projects, as you have the lab and you have people coming in, it's really their identities that have to matter and their own uh, nagging questions that you have to kind of try to help them identify. And so I try to sort of push this uh, theory onto others as much as I can. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Michael, on behalf of everybody. Um, we have time for a few questions. Do people want to jump in, unmute themselves, and ask away? Um, sorry, Kai, just on me. Go for it. Hi. Hi, uh, Michael. Very nice to meet you here. Um, so, Mike, I want to, you know, a uh, very inspiring uh, talk, and you talk about the, uh, the early struggle about physics and, the, you know, biology being not physics. So here I want to ask the question is, you know, uh, you know, I'm in school medicine, and although I have affiliation with physics department, so here, uh, you know, a big challenge I will try and uh, notice, and I'm trying to overcome is uh, how to convince uh, physics students who are maybe, you know, their mind is doing particle physics, general relativity of mere, to get interest in biology. So do you have some general thought on that? Um, well, I think that um, you can't convince everybody, but I think probably for a lot of them, if they, when they see it, it will be exciting. I mean, I think maybe the idea that you can do things quantitatively in biology, that theories can be predictive, that, uh, phenomena are testable really quickly and well, not that quickly, as quickly as we'd like, but relatively, you know, inexpensively by a couple of people on a, you know, a fast time. So there's so much satisfaction in that, that I think could be appealing for certain, certain physicists for sure. At least it was for me. And I think it has been for other physicists that I've known. I think when they see the, the way in which the problems are wide open, I think that again, for some people would be really exciting. So maybe just exposing them. I don't know what else to do really. Uh -huh. That's a good suggestion. Anybody else? 
All right. I'm going to go ahead and ask a question then, Michael. Um, I feel like a good complimentary question would be, how do you assemble a constellation of tormentors? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but maybe I'll ask you a more serious one, uh, which is, um, if I understand the strategy of following your nagging doubt, then the strategy is to chase questions much more than methods. And for those phenotype of creative people, I wonder, especially for you know, early career people, if you have any deep thoughts on um, strategizing regarding ownership of ideas, how to not let that take over all of the, all of the headspace and kill joy in the actual creative pursuit. So, so it sounds like you're, you're asking just, you mean ownership of ideas between you and collaborators or between you and, and competitors or you, you mean? In community. So, so, just in so, community yeah, like, yeah, it's so yeah. much, so much more challenging to own a question. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, science can be competitive. I, I think, um, I don't know if I have a great answer. I think one aspect is to try to remember that this phase space is large and that there is sort of room for different people to even pursue a similar question, but in different ways. And that's kind of collectively beneficial. Um, at least that's what I try to tell myself whenever we come into a <laughs> competitive situation. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be sort of Pollyannish about it. I think like you know, the difficult situations do arise. I mean, for me, it's like trying to just, um, you know, just try to keep it real somehow. You know what I mean? Like somebody's doing something for their reasons. I, I want to do something for my reasons and try to figure out. Sometimes, sometimes I think you, you can get like really paranoid. You can feel like, oh no, that's totally what we want to do. Ah, you know. <laughs> But it, a lot of times it does sort of work itself out or it pushes you to go into a new direction. So in retrospect, it can be beneficial even if at the time you feel kind of um, depressed and miserable <laughs> and, and scooped or whatever. Yeah. On that note of making lemonade, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael, really, on behalf of everybody for a terrific talk. Um, My pleasure.